All right. Welcome, everyone, to another installment of YouTube Live. My name's Kyle Ranke. I'm here with Mr. David Green himself here on the David Green Real Estate YouTube channel. What's going on? I hope everyone is doing well. Do us a favor. Drop a comment down below. Let us know where you're hanging out from tonight, what you're doing uh, and what you are up to. We always like to hear what you guys are doing. We're going to be talking tonight a little bit about uh, credit cards. And we're going to be talking about debt. Uh, and and is is the U.S. in any sort of crisis, right? Uh, we hear a lot of people talking about um, the credit card crisis. A lot of people have are taking on more debt than ever, maybe with student loans, maybe with credit cards themselves, maybe with mortgages. And a lot of people think that we're coming up to some sort of bubble where uh, with inflation, just we're not gonna be able to pay those back. Americans are not gonna pay be able to pay those back. And that's gonna result in some sort of burst of the bubble and an economic recession. So really excited and uh, looking forward to talking about those topics. Uh, but in the meantime, let us know where you are hanging out from. I love this. Ralph is already getting us started off and he's saying, hey, love is all you need. And that is absolutely right. Uh, fill in the love here, Ralph. Thanks for coming out. Kevin from Lakeland, Florida. Great to see you. Uh, Jacqueline from Austin, Texas. Beautiful. Thanks for being here. We got Esther all the way from Canada. And Mikhail. Esther's got the perfect name. For an What's investor, that? right? Esther, the investor. It's like she's made to do this. Oh, I love that. That's a great, yeah, that's a great way to put it. It's, it's got everything you need in it. Well, welcome, Esther, the investor. Uh, we got Mikhail. Now you're going to make me want to try to rhyme everything, David. Uh, Mikhail, the... Um, we'll have to oh, table gosh. that one. Mikhail's a tough yeah, one. She's, But she is she is tough as an investor, I can tell you that much. Tough as Mikhail, nails. Tough as there nails. you go. Oh, oh, yes. Uh, Vanessa's here from New Jersey playing old maid. I like that. Uh, Wendy's watching from Washington. Welcome. Phil, the Cajun investor is here from Georgia, taking care of some closing paperwork and listening to you guys. Cool, man. That's awesome. Uh, what do we got? Marnie from Seattle. Mirna from Antioch. What's up, Mirna? That's Andrea. Like we got a lot of Spartan away from where I'm recording right now. How far? 10 minutes. 10 minutes look at that you guys are right in each other's backyard andrea she's got the woot woots up uh let's see Brittany from duluth minnesota uh andrea from florida dora from napa got a lot, a lot of good looking people here hanging out uh kilo sjfd Can what you would tell you me guess what that, what that is what do you what would you guess that is I know because he was on my Instagram and I already guessed it correctly. That's why he's putting his his IG handle. Uh, something something fire department. San good, Joaquin. good. You're on the right path. What do you think the SJ is? I think you can do this. Is it San Joaquin? Very close. San something. San Jose. Else. Yes. Ah, there we go. Welcome, San to Jose. Us. Very nice. Well, thank you for uh, hanging out with us from uh, the station. Our good friend and Spartan Leaguer, Angela, happy Friday. Another Spartan Leaguer, Chris, great to see you. Uh, yeah, we got a couple people. Marnie guessed it correctly. Uh, our good Spartan Leaguer here, Lisa from Southern California. Got a lot of people hanging out tonight. Uh, I, I'm actually excited to talk about tonight's topic because I think it's actually something that doesn't get talked about enough. And it's interesting that we're talking about this tonight, because do you know what the significance of today's date is? Today is actually September 1st, 2023. This is actually the first day that student loan repayment actually begins. So uh, interested to talk about that and see what goes into tonight's topic. David, do you have any just kind of opening? Well, before we even talk about that, how's life going? I feel like we haven't been on a YouTube live here for maybe a few weeks now. I just got back from Las Vegas. I was uh, recording some podcasts with Ryan Pineda to promote pillars that should be coming out. Nice. We got into faith. We got into principles. We got into the poisonous mindset that so many people have adopted right now that is stopping them from building wealth. Uh, it was actually a pretty good time. Thank you for asking. I like that. So for the people who don't know what pillars is, do you mind explaining a little bit of what pillars is and when, when they can expect it? Yes. It looks like this right here. Actually, no, it doesn't look like this. This is the cover that I liked, but we ended up choosing a different cover. Very similar, though. 
And it's a book about how to build wealth in today's market that no one else is going to tell you. This is the um, antidote to what I think is the venom, which is get rich quick schemes. If you only knew a different strategy, Burr is dead, you subject to. Subject to doesn't work. Do Airbnb arbitrage. Use a novation. There's always something new and clever that you guys are getting sold on. And the reality is, if you don't have money, you're probably not going to have a very good time as a real estate investor. You need to learn how to manage your money and make money. You need to learn the principles behind those before you get into it. Um, I was, I'm trying to remember why the MMA analogy came up when I was talking to Brian Davila. He's uh, one of Ryan Pineda's operating officers of the Wealthy Investor Program that Ryan runs. And I think we were talking about MMA and it was basically like, look, if, if you came to an MMA coach and said, I want to learn how to fight, very similar to if you go to uh, a, a real estate educator and say, I want to build wealth. I would be reckless to take a person in bad shape who has no idea the fundamentals of fighting. They don't know the positions. They don't know how to throw a punch. They don't know how to block a punch. They cannot protect themselves and say, yeah, I'll take your money and I'll put you in a fight. It doesn't matter what you know about fighting. If you haven't practiced it and you don't have a foundation in place, you're going to get hurt. And people get hurt on their finances all the time, spending 10 grand, mm -hmm. 20 grand on some program when they don't have the, the skills, the tools, or the resources to do anything with the information. What that person should do if they go to an MMA coach is say, sure, I'll take your money, but you're not getting in that cage. I, that money is going to go towards cardio, towards working out, towards learning the fundamentals, putting the building blocks in place. And I'm not putting you in the cage until I know you can defend yourself. Uh, at minimum, because like fighting is inherently dangerous, but there's a very big difference between a person who's trained to defend themselves and a person that has no clue. Just like investing is inherently dangerous. We can all lose money, but there's fail safes that you can put in place to stop it from being too bad. Or there's things you can do to reduce the risk. The book Pillars is about the fundamentals that you have to learn if you want to get into this game. And there are three pillars. The first is defense, and that's saving money. And the book is all about, uh, actually, Kyle, you make a cameo in there telling your story with Katie of what you did to get yourself out of student debt. And you never had a huge income when you were younger, but you still had, were able to create a lot of savings and keep yourself out of debt and pay off all of your school by making smart moves. It's about having a budget. It's about having a plan for every dollar. It's about understanding how to read a profit and loss statement and run a profitable business. And these principles that people need to understand before they go chase after big wealth. And if you can't control yourself, then you probably can't control your money. The yep. second pillar is offense. This is where it gets fun. There's actually an art and a science to making money. It is not something you're just born into. The people that appear to be born into wealth and, and get jobs that make a lot of money were actually sort of like a Gracie that was born into a family that does jujitsu. They were learning the principles of fighting from the time they were really little. And, and we tend to criticize the kid who had rich parents, right? But the rich parents understood how to fight and they just taught their kid how to do good with money. And so they understood these principles that they go put into place. And what do you know? Money finds them. This is for everyone who didn't have rich parents. If you actually want to take this journey, no matter where you're starting, you can change your mindset, your approach, the way you look at life. And on those the recordings I did, we talked a lot about my journey and how I learned to be good with money because nobody in my family was. We were not a rich family. And then the third pillar of wealth building is obviously investing. I don't really have to sell anybody in this group on that, but we're hoping that this book reaches people that are not bigger pockets members or not real estate investors so they understand it's not enough to save, it's not enough to make. You got to do both and then you got to invest the difference. So you take all three pillars, you get good at all three of them, you will build wealth 100%. And uh, that is what that book is about. And I'm, and I'm really hoping that a lot of people read it and take the pillar pill. Like I'm getting rid of the, the get rich quick scheme idea. I'm getting rid of thinking that if I just go learn how to trade crypto or trade NFTs or do anything easy, that it's going to build wealth. Nope. You have to learn how to discipline yourself. You have to learn how to challenge yourself. You have to learn how to take on responsibility. You got to work like it's the last day of tryouts and you don't want to get cut every single day. And if you do that, wealth will find you. Yeah, that's really good. And, and you just made me think of something that I never realized before until just now. All three of those pillars are super important, right? You you have to have all three. Not one of them are going to stand alone. It's like the three legs on a stool, right? You can't just mm -hmm. take one away and not be good at one of them. 
and they all build off of each other. You have to start with the defense first, then you move into the offense, and then you move into the investing. You can't just skip one to go to the other. Is that kind of been what you've seen in your life, David? Well, there are certainly some people that are better at one than the other. So they have a stool that like a leg of the stool that's maybe longer and you can still sit on the stool. Theoretically, you're not just going to immediately topple over, but it's very uncomfortable. There's some people that are better at defense. These are people that are really good at budgeting. They love Dave Ramsey. They love the fire movement, mm -hmm. uh, but they think that's it. I remember I, I knew a gal when I was younger who worked at Walmart. She was a valedictorian of her high school, but her self-esteem was so low that she was a customer service agent at Walmart and made like hardly any money. And it would just like, she went to UOP, which is like a, a really nice school and had all the student debt. And then she went and got a job at Walmart and she didn't have enough confidence to go anywhere else. She was incredibly good at defense. She rented rooms from other people before it was a thing. She would only eat like an apple and a, and a thing of oatmeal every day. Mm -hmm. And like, that's how she would save. And she survived but it was an awful life. She didn't ever learn offense. She had no confidence to go promote within Walmart or get out of Walmart and get into another job. She was just addicted to the security of what she knew. And because she never challenged herself in these other ways, she never built up the confidence to go make the jump. And that's an example of how you could be really good at a pillar, but not at others. We all know the person that's great at offense. They make a ton of money. You and I both know a lot of people like this, but if they're bad at defense, the more they make, the more they spend. They don't get anywhere. They actually create a trap for themselves that they're always having to work constantly, which is great when you're young and ambitious. When you get older and you get a family and things change, you don't want to be working that much. Mm -hmm. and if you haven't incorporated defensive principles into your life, you become trapped where you're making good money, but you're a slave to it. And that's miserable. And then there's some people that have those two stools figured out, offense and defense, and they just save a bunch of money and then they watch inflation eat it up. So they did everything right except for invest their money so that it could grow. And if they don't do that part right, like that's that pillar of the stool, like you're saying that leg of the stool isn't there. I, I kind of start the book off talking about triangles and how they're actually considered the strongest shapes from um, an architectural standpoint. Triangles of all the shapes that are out there are the sturdiest. And so you really want to have this like three pronged approach. There's a verse in the Bible that a cord of three strands is not easily broken but two strands and one strand could be. So it's very basic. I, I hate to tell people like there's a lot of stories and practical examples and it'll be insightful to read it, but it's not, uh, it's not a way around the problem of being undisciplined. You're going to have to challenge yourself in life to get promoted. If your goal is to go to work every day and not work hard or just to get on cruise control, you're not getting promoted. No, no, no boss out there is looking to hire someone that's mediocre. And what I've found, and I think what you found, Kyle, is that the majority of humans will say, I will try harder when you give me a raise. I will love more within the relationship when you meet my needs. Mm -hmm. I will play harder when the coach gives me more playing time. It is a power struggle where we withhold our best until someone else gives us what we want. And my theory and my philosophy is that no one is out there looking for someone else and looking at their potential. Like, man, if I just give that guy more playing time, maybe he'll try harder. The coach who controls the playing time, which in this case is the wealth, is looking for the kid that's trying really, really hard and improving because they know if they put them in the game, they're more likely to get a good result. They're going to get a return on their wealth. So it's about changing the mindset to I'm going to work so hard that the coach has to play me. And if he doesn't play me, all of the other coaches would give me a chance on their team. And my work ethic is so great that they wouldn't be able to tell me no, that you've earned the right to get to more wealth by bringing more value, not withholding your value until life gives you what you want. Mm, very well said. I like that. Um, and yeah, you mentioned your friend who went to UOP, uh, University of the Pacific in Stockton. It is an expensive school. David, do you know the uh, what UOP stands for? University of the Pacific. Yeah, but it actually stands for, because it is so expensive, you owe plenty. Because a lot of people walk away with a lot of student loan debt, including myself, from that place. But it's interesting, you also mentioned the FIRE movement. I've been reading a lot on a different, like a bunch of different forums and Facebook groups and stuff within the FIRE movement, and it's starting to change or shift or go away, right? For those of you that don't know, the FIRE movement stands for Financial Independence Retire Early, and it's really focused on, hey, I want to be able to live as lean as I can 
and become financially independent as quickly as I can so that I can retire at the age of about 30 something. But a lot of people are, are in, in a lot of the forums I'm reading are saying like, it's actually really hard to do right now with inflation. It's just, it's, it's almost not a thing anymore. I wouldn't be surprised if the fire movement really turns into more of a lean living slash minimalist movement yeah. um, to help you kind of scale down. But I think that the retire early part is going to be going away pretty soon because a lot of people, just, they just can't retire. Even if you're living on beans and rice, you still can't retire on that. You know, I start the book off before I get into the meat and potatoes of the defense, the offense and the investing. It's a rich book, like German chocolate cake. You're going to only be able to read a little bit of it at a time because it's so in depth, which is why it was so hard to write. But I started off with a call to action for why this is important. And it's very similar to what you just said. You People don't realize how little their dollar is actually holding its value. Like you, you, the whole, I retired at 30, I'll never work again, would have made sense if we didn't have inflation making everything expensive. It, it doesn't. And the analogy that I give, or one of the analogies that I give is we tend to look at ourselves like we're standing on a staircase and we're on the middle of the staircase that that higher you go represents more wealth. OK, and climbing the stairs takes effort. So we have this idea in our head. If I work harder, I go higher and I'm trading effort for wealth. Well, at a certain point, you get halfway up the stairs and you stop and you say, this is enough. I don't need more. I don't want to keep working really hard. That could mean retiring or in this example, that might just mean I'm not going to work as hard. I'm going to kind of hit cruise control and just show up every day and do my job. And mm -hmm. I'm not doing more than my job. I'm not going to go take courses to learn new skills. I'm not going to improve myself. I'm just going to chill. I'm going to hit cruise control. Okay. Plane has flown and it hit an altitude and it's just it's chilling right there. It's not trying to go higher. And we have this false sense that as long as we are staying where we are on the stairs, we're not walking down that we're staying even, but you're not. Inflation has changed the dynamics of the economy to where you're actually standing on an escalator that looks like a stairwell, and it is going down. And by standing in place, you are you are losing money inherently in this case. Mm -hmm. You are losing wealth just not doing anything. You actually have to go up the, stair, the stairs, in this case, or the escalator, to stay even. And if you want to go up, you got to run and burn a lot of calories to get ahead. It is sort of a dire position that I think we're in in our economy, but nobody feels it because they're just standing on the stairs. If someone was pushing you down the stairs, you would think, oh my God, I'm losing it. But because we're standing in place, we think we're okay. Our eyes are closed. We don't realize that the escalator is going down. And so the people that see this, that are paying attention, like you just said, the fire movement is very conscious of what's happening in the conscious of what's happening in the economy. They are paying attention. They are realizing, man, that five grand a month that we had coming in isn't enough to get it done anymore. I'm going to need more. And you're seeing less and less people with that whole like work shame thing that was like, oh, are you still working at 35? Well, you're greedy. You, you should quit, right? Like now working is something you got to do to stay ahead, but that doesn't mean that you can go splurge on things. Like you really got to watch your wallet and you got to put effort in just to stay even. And I know that's not a popular message. There's going to be people out there that tell you that there's an abundant mindset and there's tons of opportunity out there. There is if you follow the principles that wealth builds, right? So I have another example in the book where I talk about the pursuit of excellence as part of one of the principles in the offensive pillar. You have got to be pursuing being excellent at what you do. Kyle, if you want to get a taco, are you going to ask other people the most mediocre taco in Roseville? No, I'm going to ask them where I can find the best. That's all you care about, right? Mm -hmm. The whole reason Yelp exists is so we can identify what is the best. Right. And, and no one has to tell us that we're supposed to want the best. When you look at a Corolla or you look at a Lamborghini, can't you inherently tell that more attention went into the design of a Lamborghini than a Corolla? Very much. Yeah. Society doesn't have to teach you that one of those is worth more than the other. You can tell that there was an a air of excellence that went into at least the design on the outside of Lamborghini. And when you sit in the Lamborghini and you punch the gas, you can tell or a Tesla maybe that the result you get is much more excellent than when you punch the gas of a Corolla. You don't need to be a professional mechanic or race car driver to know the difference between those two cars. You feel the excellence. Well, if you want to run a successful business or you want to build wealth, you got to realize that everybody in the world is looking for the best taco in town. 
No one's looking for mediocre. And what's happened is we've been taught by social media to think about our own needs. I want an easy life. I want financial freedom. I want to just be able to chill and other people should support my dream. But I don't care what the guy with the mediocre tacos wants. I don't care if he says, well, I don't want to work all day. I don't want to try this hard. I want passive income. I've already got a taco stand. Why do I have to keep competing? I want to chill. There's more to life than just work, Kyle. Yeah. And I don't care because I want the best taco. And so do you. And so does everyone mm -hmm. else. We go to the best. So my the healthier perspective, in my opinion, is not work yourself to death. It is be the best. Work to get to be the best. And when you have the best taco stand, you can then delegate or leverage or use these business principles to get some enjoyment back in your life. But you can't stop until you're at the top because there's always someone who wants to take what you have. They want to take your job. They want to take your opportunity. They want to buy that asset that you want. And when we don't recognize that we're in a competitive environment, we lose, right? Like you remember going to tryouts, you knew there's only so many spots on that team and you want one of them. Yep. Imagine if you showed up to tryouts and you didn't realize that there was only a limited number of spots because you were raised to believe that it's not fair that some people get cut. So you just showed up at practice and thought, because you're here, you deserve to be on the team. When there were sprints, you probably wouldn't run your fastest, would you? When you got tired, you'd probably slow down. When you turn the ball over and the coach yelled at you, you'd probably think there's something wrong with him. Why is he being mean? That's toxic. That's abusive. You come up <laughs> with some phrase to put on the coach for making you feel bad about the mistake you made. You wouldn't put the responsibility on yourself to get better at basketball and think, I don't like this negative feeling that I'm getting. Let me improve to make it go away. You wouldn't be pursuing excellence. You'd be pursuing comfort. Take that ridiculous idea and apply it to the workplace, and that's what we have. And so you mean I shouldn't get a trophy for just showing up for the interview? You shouldn't get a uniform for just showing up for, <laughs> for tryouts. And, and playing time isn't uh, dealt out on a socialistic scale. They don't give the same playing time to every player because you're trying to win. Now, if, if the teams weren't trying to win, it would turn into equal playing time, which would turn into less effort, which would turn into worse basketball, which would turn into socialistic countries that mm -hmm. or economies that have a lower GDP that don't do well. Okay. Yeah. You're in a freaking competition in life. We are all competing over what we want to be the best. And that does not have to be toxic. Recognizing mm -hmm. that truth can actually be very healthy, which is why you and I talk so much about personal improvement and self growth is our eyes have been open to the fact that we are in a competition. Other people want to get that listing that we want. Other people want to take our buyer clients from us. When we're representing a buyer, other buyers want that same house, right? So if yeah. our clients are allowed to whine and complain and moan about how it's not fair that they have to pay more, and we don't tell them the truth that someone else will pay more and you'll get nothing, we're not doing right by them. We are forced to live in this reality that you, some people get cut, that there's not enough to go around, that the idea of the abundance mindset only applies to the people that are really good at basketball or make really good tacos. When you have the best tacos in town, yeah, there's an abundance of opportunity. When your tacos suck, there's not. No one's fighting to go get mediocre tacos. No one's like, you know what? These tacos are terrible, but it's not fair that this store over here gets all the business. So I'm going to go buy crusty, nasty, rotten <laughs> tacos to make it fair. Everyone is looking for excellence. So if you're listening to this right now, you're following me. Kyle and I and everybody in our association strives for excellence. And that doesn't mean we're there, but that's the journey that we're on. We are trying to run up that escalator that is going down. And, and that's what the book is about, telling people the truth that they may not have heard before. Not to mention when you when you earn that jersey, right? When you get that spot on the team, um, there's a sense of pride that you get. It, it's fun being on the team. It, it, you're competing still every single day, yes. Um, but there it's, you're at a completely different level than you would have been if you were just sitting on the sidelines and watching or complaining or armchair quarterbacking. Um, and it's even the same, like with the people that we hire, I, what we're hiring for a position right now. Uh, and I think we've had about four or 500 applications come in, no joke. And we still have not hired for that position, not because people aren't necessarily, um, not because they're not qualified. A lot of people are qualified, but it's because some of them, they just don't have that passion 
for what they're doing. They're the kind of people that will probably be gone in six months or they don't have that competitive spirit where they want to come in every single day and, and say like, I want to be the absolute best taskmaster or whatever that, posi that position is or that role or whatever. Um, a lot of people have that entitlement. Like, no, I want to be the star. I want to be the guy that gets the ball every single time. Or, or I, I be want the guy. a guaranteed contract regardless of how I perform. Yeah. That's what a yeah. lot of, that's what I see a lot of the employees. They're like, Hey, why are you applying for this job? Well, I want to work from home. My last boss made me do a lot of stuff. I just want work life balance. I want less stress in my life. Okay. Are you willing to take less money? No, no, no. I still need this much money to live. <laughs> yeah. Like it's, and I'm not even trying to throw shade at people that say it. I don't think no. they realize what they are saying. That's what, that's why I wrote the book. That's what we're talking about. What they're saying is that it is someone else's responsibility to provide me the money that I need to live. It is a right to me. Okay. I want to be on the basketball team because I need an identity as a basketball player. I agree with you that you do. That's very important as a young man to have a thing to belong to. I need the accountability from the coaching. I need the training. Those are all healthy things, but it is not your right to get what you need. It mm -hmm. is no one else's responsibility to give you what you need. It's yours. And this will this will ruffle a lot of feathers just saying this because we've been lulled into this belief that it's the government's job or your parents' job or <clears throat> a bigger pocket's job or my job or your job to help people be successful or to give them success, right? When they're applying for that job, we're looking to see, do you want it? What are you going to do for the team? What are you going to do for the company? Are you going to help us win with what our goals are? And you know what it's like when you interview them. That's a foreign concept. They're, it doesn't even occur to them that that's a fair thing that we should ask for. I think they hear it and they think, wow, those guys are jerks. They want me to work hard. They want me to explain what I'm offering. Hey, I'm me. Take it or leave it. Like there's a lot of that in the world. You see it when you're dating. You see it in business. You see it in relationships. Like I don't have to change anything. If you don't like me, there's someone else that does. And, and I just I'm asking everyone to consider that you go buy tacos and you complain about the meat being dry or the tortilla stale or there's a hair and the person replies, hey, that's how we do it. If you don't like it, go somewhere else. How many people are going to say, fine, I'm going to eat this hair? Yeah, it's not how I'm we curious. Think. I'm curious what the pulse is. We got about 70 people here listening. Is this something you guys agree with? Do you disagree with it? Um, do you feel like what David's saying about, Hey, you have to be skilled. You have to be competitive. Um, or is there somebody that disagrees? It's like, no, actually, I, don't, I think what you're saying is wrong. I think we should move towards a more equal and fair playing ground where everybody gets the same amount of playing time and everybody gets the same type of benefits. Everybody gets the same pay. Um, let us know what you're thinking. By the way, if you're getting some value out of this, if you like this conversation, make sure to hit that like button, hit that subscribe button, um, and also turn on the bell notification. We want to make sure you guys know that we're here just about every single week, and we are talking about these kinds of topics. We're talking about the pillars to building wealth. We're talking about um, the economy. We're talking about mortgages. We're talking about house hacking. We're talking about building wealth through real estate. We're talking about being the best person that you can. In addition to that, we're also going to be looking at bringing some different people on experts in their respective fields, like we've done in the past to talk specifically about what they're doing in their business and in their life and in their world to make themselves successful as well. Um, let's go to, right here to the group. Uh, Jeremy says, uh, yeah, there's always a price to pay for your goals, 100%. Javier says he agrees, 150%. Mikhail brings up a good point. She says 100% agree, which is why a lot of Airbnb operators are being phased out, right? Because that is a competitive space, and you got to either be good let's at what you do. Let's just stop right there, Kyle. That is such a great point that you yeah. make. And I'm sorry to take the microphone away from you because you were doing really good. But how many people bought an Airbnb? Let us know in the chat. Did you get into the short-term rental game because you heard other influencers are in the space or other people that own one telling you how much money they made? Who here will say, yeah, I bought an Airbnb and I thought it would go a lot better than it did because I heard everybody else talking about how much money they make, right? So I'm going to let everybody answer that and I'm not going to let there be dead air. So I'll keep talking. But Kyle, would you agree you heard a lot of that over the last five oh. years? 
Yeah, I've talked I've talked with a lot of different people um, who have gotten into the Airbnb game recently, thinking it was going to be one way, and then have struggled to compete against the competition and, and to do well and stand out that's, and run that's that what business. Happened. Everybody ran to the space to buy properties, and it's a long story, but it's predictable. the The price of homes kept going up while interest rates also went up. Cash flow basically disappeared from your average deal. People were forced to leave the traditional rental space and get into the short term rental space to get any kind of ROI. And everyone's thirsty for ROI. They're all chasing the same assets because of competition that I keep talking about. Now there's too much supply and not enough demand in the short term rental space. So yeah. when there's too much supply, a lot of places that sell tacos and not enough demand and not enough people that want to eat tacos, can every single taco stand succeed? No. No, they can't. There's only so much demand to go around, right? Yeah. So what ended up happening was that the operators that put the most effort, the most attention, brought the most skill, improved themselves the most, ran the most profitable Airbnbs. And the people that said, I want passive income. I don't want to try. I don't want to get good at this. I already did my work. I just want to relax. They fell behind. And their properties didn't perform very well. Okay. Or they bought a taco stand in a city that is full of vegans. And they just couldn't sell anything, right? So like Angela Haydorn says, I feel attacked because she heard this. (laughs) In Angela's case, there wasn't much that she could do to improve the management of her Airbnb because there was too damn many of them. Right. It just like she bought into a market where the supply demand was way off and no one told her that she even needed to think about that. This is before she was in Spartan League. She didn't understand that the fundamentals of how business work. Now she's going to bounce back because we both know and we love Angela. We know she's going to do well. But this is a great example. If you don't read pillars, if you don't understand the stuff that's in there, if you're not tracking what we're talking about, it's very easy to buy the wrong property. It is very easy to buy into the wrong place. It's very easy to have the wrong idea. And I'll wrap it up by putting a little bow on it and saying this, Kyle, if you were trying to sell a course to teach people how to do something like a fitness course, okay, would you go and you would show all the people that tried and failed and the misery of it? Would you interview people that said, this was the hardest thing I ever did. I throw up every single day and I've done this for three months and I'm sore and I'm miserable and I've seen no progress. Or would you go find the prettiest, fittest girl and the buffest, fittest guy and have them say, you know what? I show up once a week. I barely break a sweat. I just do a little bit. And I don't know. I just ended up with this six pack (laughs) where maybe they had that six pack to start with. Maybe they're genetic freaks and they don't have to work as hard. Which one of those would make it easier to sell the memberships to your gym? Oh, the second one. A hundred percent. There you go. That is what has happened within this space. And I'm not calling anyone out. I'm just saying it is human nature to lie. You guys are going to be lied to. People are going to explain it in a way that isn't accurate because it's better for them. In the book, I talk about the example of how in the defense pillar, you don't think about the fact that there are companies that have people way smarter than you that are paid much more money than you, that are single focused on becoming incredibly good marketers. They are good. They are great. They are excellent. They have pursued excellence at the art of taking your money away from you and giving it to their boss. They can make you want something you didn't even know you wanted before you saw the commercial. They can make you feel bad about yourself when you felt great before you saw the ad, right? You think it's a coincidence, Kyle, when you're walking through the mall and you smell that Cinnabon? Oh, not at all. No, that's a smart person that figured out you Mm -hmm. didn't want a cinnamon roll, but I made you want it. And after I make you want it, I'm going to be here to provide it for you. I created demand out of nothing. And then I gave you the supply that you needed to meet that demand. Right. Do you think that person loves you? Do you think eating Cinnabon's healthy for you? Are they motivated by like, we want to make healthier people? No, not at all. Yeah, that's what I'm getting at. If you don't realize that walking through your day every day, you are in a world with enemies that are trying to separate you from every dollar that you've earned. And at your job, you are in a competition every day with other people that want the playing time. You're going to lose. Because when I was in those positions, I knew it was a competition for who got the most tables. I knew that I, in a restaurant, I knew that I wasn't entitled to getting them. I knew when I got my real estate license that I wasn't entitled to get clients that I had to fight and that everyone knew other realtors and I had to be better. 
I understood it. And that's all that it took. I'm not the most talented guy, Kyle. You can admit to people. I am not the most personable, best realtor. I only got to the top because my eyes were open to the fact I was in competition and other people weren't. Same for when I was buying properties out of state. I got in early. Everybody else thought it was stupid. I recognized this window is only going to be open for so long before everybody else figures out real estate is by far a better asset class than everything else. And that long distance investing is not as tricky as it sounded. So I bought as many houses as I could and I'm glad because now there's not that much to buy. So uh, this is the principles that I, I think wealthy people teach their kids. And if you guys are that are listening to this are tired of being broke, you're tired of not getting promoted. You're tired of feeling like you're left behind. You're tired of not having confidence. It's like being tired of being fat. The only way that you get unfat is that you have a better diet and that you work out more and wealth works the same way. Yeah, that's, that's really good. I mean, just the fact that we are marketed at nearly 24 seven and the people that are marketing at us have spent millions, if not billions of dollars. And not only in, in what they're doing to get that thing in front of us to, to get that Cinnabon smell to, to enter our olfactory nerves. But in addition to that, they have spent millions and billions of dollars on research to figure out how to hack our, our biology in a sense. Right. So a lot of times we go and we buy that freaking Cinnabon just because we don't even realize we're doing it right so for the people watching this and listening tonight uh, I would I would challenge you guys this week to maybe take some time to think about um, and become aware of how are you being marketed right how are you um, being sort of sold on how to separate that money from your wallet because it happens to us on a daily basis and being awake to that uh, is going to be super super important that's one of the first steps and one of the things we talk about in Spartan League all the time clifford says david green with the painful truth that everyone needs more taco analogies please i like that we'll talk about it <laughs> um okay cool so we were supposed to talk about credit cards tonight so i'm gonna go ahead and just give us a beautiful pivot into credit cards a lot of this actually has to do with what we're talking about right credit cards just happen to be a piece of that entire financial picture uh, and really kind of what motivates you to use credit cards, right? Are you using it for the points? Are you using it because you're struggling right now because um, maybe your your expenses have gone up, but your income has not, right? There's a lot of people that are putting more and more and more money on their credit cards, but there's also a lot of people that are becoming more delinquent and unable to pay their credit cards as well. So, um, I'm going to start us off here in a, uh, a video here from uh, that we're going to watch. Let me get the guy's name again really quick. Uh, and Andre Jick, I think his last name is. Um, he's going to be talking a little bit about the credit card crisis and um, give some of his opinions on what is going on. So let me pull that up and get it going. So the U.S. just broke a new record, and unfortunately, it's not a good record because U.S. credit card debt has now reached the highest point that it's ever been in history. For the first time in history, credit card debt for Americans has hit one trillion dollars, to be exact, one trillion and three billion dollars. That's right. Even though the government tells us that inflation is finally slowing down, the truth is prices are still too high, which has translated to people relying more and more on their credit cards to pay for everyday life. But what's interesting about this problem is that the average American is too embarrassed to talk about this issue. We found that people would rather talk about their weight, their <laughs> political views, their religious views. They'd rather talk about a lot of sensitive things rather than credit card debt. We'd rather talk about politics and religion, and two out of five Americans think that credit card debt is just too embarrassing, which is bad because eventually credit card debt will have an impact on the economy. And that can be seen with something called delinquency rates which are going up. And delinquency is just a fancy way of saying when people can't afford to pay back their credit cards on time. And when that happens, that's usually a very bad sign for the economy because the way we prioritize paying off our debt is first we pay off our mortgage loan, then our auto loans, and then credit cards. 
So this could be the very first bad sign of things to come. And the majority of people that are most in danger of not paying back their credit cards are people ages 18 to 29 and 30 to 39. But already one out of 10 people that have a credit card are 90 days or more behind. And unfortunately, thanks to this still high inflation and the possibility of higher interest rates, people are opening up more and more credit card accounts to pay for everyday life. And if you're like, Andre, I don't really use credit cards, so this video is not for me. Regardless, if you're someone who relies on credit cards, cards or not, this is still important because credit card debt will eventually affect all of us. So in today's video, I want to share with you the latest data and how this will affect the recession. And then I want to show you a step-by-step -step plan of how to reduce your credit card debt. And then I want to show you what I'm personally doing to prepare for all of this. So let's get into it. Hi, my name is Andre Jick. Hope you're doing well. Come for the finance and stay for the embarrassing stuff, which we have to get out of the way first. You see, sometimes I'll do card tricks in my videos and someone will notice and I'll be in a commercial or a TV show. And this past week, I was in a dragon outfit being a hand double for Piff the Magic Dragon. So this is me in a dragon onesie. So now that you've seen me in a dragon outfit all by me onesie savvy, we have to talk about credit card debt because now that we're both embarrassed, chances are if you're embarrassed about credit card debt, you are not alone. More than a third of Americans are embarrassed about their credit card debt. In fact, we're so embarrassed about it that in some cases we hide it from our significant other. 15% of the 2,000 people they asked this question to said they spend more money than their partner would approve of. And even 9% admitted to having secret credit card debt, which also might explain why financial stress is the single biggest reason for people getting a divorce. And believe it or not, it's the people that are making six figures or more that are in credit card debt the longest. The point is that everyone thinks about credit card debt and we all worry about it to some degree. Regardless of our age and regardless of how much money we make, we should be able to openly talk about it because it affects not only our personal relationships, but the country as a whole. And that's because 54 million people have been in credit card debt for at least one year and almost half, 47% of all credit card holders carry their debt month to month. Now, why this is such a big deal is this. Credit card debt this year grew as much as the stock market did. For example, VOO, which is the ETF that represents the S&P 500, the stock market is up 17% this year. And credit card debt grew by 16% this year. And here's what that actually means. Remember that the average returns for the stock market over the last 100 years was between 7 to 10%. And right now we're at 17%, which is not normal. So if you're one of the roughly 190 million Americans that has a credit card, and if you carry the average balance of over $5,000, your debt is probably growing at the same pace as one of the fastest stock markets that we've had in a while, which means you'll never be able to build any significant amount of savings or wealth, even if you try to out invest your debt, if you carry a credit card balance month to month. Interest rates, though, on credit cards have now risen to over 20% on average, and that's making it an extremely expensive way to borrow money for Americans using credit cards to cover basic household costs and many other expenses, too. Now, thankfully, 37% of Americans do pay off their credit cards month to month, but 12% don't, and they only make the minimum payments. But check out the effect that this would have and how long it'll take you to pay off just a $5,000 credit card balance. Assuming the average 22% APR, it would take you 281 months or 23 years, and you would have paid over $8,500 worth of interest. And depending on how your minimum payments and interest is calculated, if, for example, it's 2% of your balance, which some predatory credit card companies will do, that $5,000 could turn into $48,000 worth of interest in over 106 years to pay off. In other words, you'll be paying this for the rest of your life. And in some cases, that debt could grow faster than you'll ever be able to pay it down. Now, if you find yourself in that very unfortunate circumstance, here's what you might consider doing. First, call your card issuer and ask for a lower annual percentage rate. A lending tree survey found about three quarters of consumers who asked for a lower rate in the past year got one. Sometimes it's as easy as calling the phone number on the back of the credit card and just asking for a lower APR. Now, it won't be much lower, but anything can help. It also helps to pretend to have an accent. Hello, I want lower APR. Don't actually do that. It will not help, especially if it's a Russian accent. Also, try to snag a 0% 
interest balance transfer card. These cards offer 12, 15, even 20 months with no interest on transfer balances. Now, once you get one, you got to be aggressive about paying off as much of the balance as you can during that introductory period. That's right. So you can actually transfer your credit card balance from one credit card to a new one that is offering an introductory 0% APR. And that's the time you want to spend and be aggressive towards paying down the credit card balance because you won't pay any interest. But there is a catch. The catch is that you have to get approved for one of these, but if you can, it's completely worth it. I did this for my parents a couple years ago and it really helped them out. If you have a credit card balance, please do this as early as you can because in September, student loan interest will start to grow again. And by October of this year in 2023, the first student loan payments will start back up again. Now, the good news is that there's a new program called the On-Ramp Leniency Program, which essentially allows anyone who was late or who missed their payments to not be reported to the collection agencies right away. The bad news though is that this program ends on September 30th 2024. So don't just stop paying your student loans because you think there's no consequences because remember interest will still grow in that time frame. Now the even better news is that there's a better option. It's a new program you might not have heard of before this video called the save program. And depending on your family size, you can cut your payments down by half or to zero dollars. And the best part is that you won't be accruing interest while you're in this program, but you have to actually apply and get accepted. And I've left a link down below where you can do that, or you can go directly to studentaid.gov forward slash IDR and then apply. Now that's the good news, but the bad news is it looks like we could already be in a recession and credit card debt is just one of the bad records we've broken. There's four more. The U.S. has also reached a record $17.1 trillion in household debt, a record $12 trillion in mortgage debt, a record $1.6 trillion in auto loans, and a record $1.6 in student loan debt. So we've broken five really bad records. We're like the anti-Michael Phelps. These are not good records to break, which is also why some economists are telling us we could go into a bad recession. But also surprisingly, if you look at something called debt as a percent of disposable income, meaning how much America Americans are paying in relation to how much money they're making, it's looking pretty good. So what that chart showed us is that Americans do have disposable income to pay down their debt if they wanted to, despite the U.S. breaking all these record levels of debt. Unfortunately, predicting a recession at this point is like flipping a coin. It could go either way. And personally, I don't even know what to believe anymore. But here's what I'm doing to prepare. Please remember that this is my per. All right. So, um, there, there's no doubt that we have some sort of crisis in 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 the world, right? And I love how Jason says, hey, hey, listen, if I take on enough credit card debt, can I get too big to fail status and get a bailout? Um, you could probably go bankrupt, right? And, and that might help. That might fix your situation. It won't help your situation with student loan debts, right? Student loan debt is uh, is not anything you can just go bankrupt and make those payments go away or make that debt go away. That's literally indentured servitude for the rest of your life. Um, and we, we used the analogy earlier, David, of the person who maybe is sitting on the sidelines and not looking to be competitive, not looking to build up their skill set, not looking to do well at uh, whatever it is that they're doing at their job or their work, their ability to create income. And so they just sit on the sidelines. They don't get to be on the team. But what would you say to somebody who's maybe even be beyond that, right? Maybe they've got like 50, 60, 70, $100,000 in debt, and they have to like clean that up before they can even get in the game, right? Before they can even start to invest. Um, I, what comes to mind for me is the fact that um, a lot of people right now, like the government's giving these programs, right? He mentioned, oh, I think we lost David there. He might be trying to reset his, let me see. Oh, his internet's really bad. But um, we see a lot of people, right, who start off way behind. They're struggling to pay um, their, their bills on a regular basis. They're struggling to get any kind of traction. And so as a result, they can never truly get ahead. And the government comes out with these amazing programs, right, where it's like, hey, listen, if you don't pay your student loans for the next two years and you get behind on payments, we just won't report you to the credit bureaus. That's nice. That's a good thing. But then in addition to that, um, there's also, you know, hey, we'll lower your payment. But that doesn't fix the problem. That doesn't fix the issue, right? 
you can get the help that you need to stop the bleeding, but that's not necessarily going to improve your situation overall. Something has to change in who you are. Something has to change in your skill set, in your ability to manage money, right? Both on the ability to make more that can come in, right? The ability to, to earn more income, but also the ability to uh, prevent yourself from continually spending yourself into a deficit, very much like we see with our government. Um, and yes, Mikhail, this is now the Kyle takeover. What you guys don't know is I actually secretly went behind uh, David's office today and just snipped his internet connection so that he wouldn't be able to connect. So, uh, but fortunately, I like to talk uh, as well. So, um, but yeah, so I'm curious with the people here that are watching who here uses credit cards, whether for a business or personal use on a regular basis. And also put in the chat, do you carry a balance uh, or do you get that thing paid off every month? Is there anybody here that's struggling or challenged right now with credit card debt? David mentioned my story a little bit earlier and it's going to be in his Pillars book. Uh, I started with a ton of student loan debt. I, I graduated from college um, with two master's degrees and over six figures in student loan debt. And I had to start behind and I really didn't have that great of an income. It was a decent income compared to, uh, you know, the rest of the nation, but it wasn't very good compared to, um, what I was, uh, what I had in terms of how much I had to pay every month. Um, David, welcome back to the session. Are you, are we coming through clear on your end now? Internet struggles, man. I'm sorry. The uh, office internet just got really bad. It's like less than one megabyte per second right now that I'm downloading Ooh. it. So as long as you guys can hear me, we're okay. But thanks for manning the ship there. Yeah, absolutely. So what I was talking about was um, the analogy you used earlier was, listen, if you want to make the team, uh, you got you to gotta be competitive, right? You got to have skills. You can't just come in and say, hey, coach, put me on the team. But there's like a whole nother group of people that are super behind when it comes to uh, their ability to manage finances, right? These are the people that are in significant student loan or credit card or both debt. Um, yeah. What would you say to like, where do those people fit in on the analogy? Is that a completely different analogy or a different set of people with a different type of conversation? You're saying the people that are not good at managing credit card debt. Is that what that was? Yeah. yeah. Well, let's go We're with just the managing money that we had. Okay. Like, there's certain guys that grew up understanding how to play basketball and there's other guys that never touched the ball their whole life. So mm -hmm. you and I played a lot of basketball. We can pit, have a pickup game and some guy can join us. And it in, in under five seconds, we can tell basically if they play junior high, high school, college, perfect, like, you know, all. it doesn't take much for you to be able to yeah. tell how much ball they played. Okay. So if you grew up never playing basketball, you aren't going to know how to dribble a ball. Dribbling is like, you don't, people don't realize because the guys on TV make it look easy. It is freaking hard to do while you are running. You can't look at it, right? And then changing direction and trying to move the ball with you, it's really hard. Shooting is not a thing that you just do. It is a thing that you have to practice the movements of that frequently, okay? If we judged, if we expected every human being to be good at basketball just because they're a human, that would be stupid. Yep. But if you grew up playing basketball, we'd expect you to be pretty good. I don't think money is different. There is fundamentals, just like with sports, that if you understand with money, you'll be good with it. A, a lot of it is just uh, the um, like, so playing basketball, right? Like if you and I are playing ball, there's certain things that emotionally would feel wrong to do on a basketball court. Like right. you wouldn't go stand right next to another guy on your team. That would be stupid. If you yeah. saw a guy driving in the basket, you wouldn't cut to the spot he's trying to get to, right? What you do instead, like when you used to drive, is I'd try to box out the guy that would be coming to block your shot, like keep keep a space for you to get there. But if you didn't know how basketball worked, that's exactly what they do. Like you're trying to break down your defender and the guy runs right into you and brings his defender with him. And you're like, oh, now where am I supposed to you go? You don't do that. Yeah. Right? Money's similar. There's things where I just feel wrong. Like, that's a bad idea. Why would I spend money on that? Or I don't need that right now. I can wait till I get home. Or it's stupid to buy that that clothes or whatever that thing would be. And if you just grew up never understanding that stuff, you're going to be bad at money. If, if you don't know what your employer is looking for, you're not going to be good at work. Okay, we all know the people that just sucked at their jobs. And even if they tried hard, they tried hard in all the wrong ways. 
they couldn't figure out the right pattern. It was like they didn't – there's basketball players that try really hard, but if their footwork is terrible, it doesn't matter how hard they're trying. Like, remember when you'd see a soccer player that was trying to play basketball? I always knew what, what the case was because, like, they wouldn't – they would, like, follow their man that they were guarding – and stand on it's super close yes yeah. <laughs> like it, to a basketball player you would never do that if your guy's yeah. standing way over there you're kind of halfway in between him and the guy with the ball but you know exactly where i was going they would just be like attached to him because in soccer that's how you do it there's people that work that way they just assume that like certain effort turns into value and it doesn't because they just weren't taught this and that's what i think people that are bad at money i don't think it's in it's impossible for them to get good at money but they have to be willing to lose what's in their head to put something better in the head. The soccer player cannot bring soccer fundamentals into basketball. They are different. You can bring soccer willpower, soccer drive, soccer ambition. That's all good. Soccer cardio. Mm -hmm. But the the rhythm of the game, the spacing of the game, like basketball is all, it's not about where you are in the court. It's about where you are in relation to the guy guarding you. Like you can have him half an inch behind you and that's enough to get a shot off. He doesn't have to be seven feet behind you. Soccer might be a little bit different. So uh, I'm passionate about teaching people the way that wealthy people think because they've got it figured out. And if you're someone who's not good, like Angela just gave an example, when before she joined Spartan League, she had a balance. She probably didn't get anything of it. Why would you not have a balance? If everyone you grew up grew up with credit card debt, why would you not have it? You see certain communities have terrible credit. Is it because they're stupid? No. The value system of those communities don't believe in paying their rent. Like if you don't have enough money, you just don't pay the landlord. That's just a normal thing to do. And so they end up with really bad credit or they go take on debt and don't think about how they're going to pay it back. I mean, Charles Barkley it was just crazy. He was a grown man talking about the first time he got a credit card. He did not understand that he had to pay back the money that he spent on it. Hmm. He thought in his mind like he was being rewarded by society for becoming a professional basketball player that now they send you a credit card that like someone else out there was going to pay for it or the company didn't care if you paid or not. It just in his weird head at that time in his life, that made sense to him. So uh, that's that's I think what it comes down to is like you can get good at any sport, but you got to learn the rules of that sport, not necessarily what you did somewhere else. Yeah, and the other thing I mentioned while you were uh, reconfiguring your internet was it's great that the government provides different programs, right? Relief programs. Hey, we're gonna we're we're not gonna tell the the credit bureaus that you didn't pay this month. We're gonna give you a little bit of a grace period, or hey, we're gonna let you uh kind of lower your payment depending on what your income is. That is all great, but that doesn't solve you becoming a better basketball player, right? That maybe creates an, an opening or an opportunity for you to come to practice, but you still have to gain and develop and really focus on those skills to becoming that skilled person. And I think that's a big focus of what we talk about. That's what we talk about in the Spartan League. We had some really good talks on the Spartan League last night. Um, because we'll do inventory checks. We'll do audits where we say, all right, how's everybody doing on their finances right now? When's the last time you looked at your finances? When's the last time you looked at what you're spending every single month? What do those conversations look like with your spouse or your, your partner or whoever? Um, and where are you bleeding that you could fix some things? You could become a little bit more uncomfortable, not just for the sake of being uncomfortable, but for the sake of putting yourself in a position to be stronger and better uh, when it comes to your finances. And it's interesting. We have a lot of people like Angela who uh, even on last night's call were saying, man, yeah, I, I actually realized I was paying way too much in insurance. I was able to renegotiate my insurance down on my car, on my house. Um, I was able to figure out like I was, I had to kind of a, a plug for me, a, a shame, shameful plug. I had to tell people like, yeah, I figured out I had two streaming accounts that were being charged, like two Netflixes. Like, uh, so I was double paying for that, right? So um, those kinds of things are the, the the topics that we talk about. But those are the things that a lot of people just don't realize they're spending yeah. money and it's just being leaked out left and right. They don't see it. Well, that's because they don't realize that the company Netflix or whatever else is intentionally setting up payments so that you don't see them. Yeah, they they want it to look convenient, but the convenience is why you allow it. Like when I eat bad food, it's always because it was convenient. I'm not like, you know what I want to do? I want to ruin my my health for the rest of the day by eating fast food right now. Mm -hmm. Instead, it's like, dude, I'm hungry and it's right there. 
every time convenience will turn into a problem. Yep. When you're looking at your budget every day, it is inconvenient to do that, or maybe every week, but see where your money's going. But the inconvenience is what causes you to stop spending on dumb things. When you realize where the money's going, it, it's pretty easy to recognize you don't want to keep doing it. Yeah. Tracking is what successful people do to be successful. The like a bodybuilder tracks that what they're lifting. They make sure it's going up and that becomes where they get a dopamine release from. I added weight to what I was doing. It feels good. I am making progress. Uh, people that are trying to lose weight track their macros. They track what they're eating and how much of it they're eating. Business people track numbers. They look at profit and loss statements. They look at sales. Like, And then once you see what you're tracking, your job is to figure out how do we improve it? How do we spend less and make more? What are the things that would lead to making more revenue or spending less? Uh, Jason Woolahan is in our group, and he's really good at tracking what makes people pick a, a short-term rental. Why did they pick this one versus that one? What do we need to do to improve so that more people pick ours? He's putting attention into it. He's trying. So is it a shock that when he took over one of my cabins within five days of taking it over, it had been booked three times when it wasn't being booked at the person that had it before that wasn't tracking it. So what we're getting at here is if you care about wealth, which you obviously do because you're listening to me on YouTube, you're not doing this because of my good looks. Although that is why I brought Kyle in to sort of be the eye candy <laughs> so we can improve our viewership and you're not tracking what your goal is, then you're not trying to win. Like in a competition, we keep score. That's what tracking is, right? Like a professional sports team, don't they track every player's stats? How many rebounds are so you getting? Much. I mean, that's yeah. what like sports has turned into. Like, you know, that wins above replacement in baseball. How much are you better than an average player at your position or worse are you? Or in basketball, they call it the plus minus. Like if we took you out or put you in, how many more points does our team tend to score when you're on the floor? They're tracking it because it matters because these are billion dollar companies that if they're not winning, they're not going to be making as much money. This is what we're getting at. It, there's a fundamental of understanding it, and it's the opposite of convenience. So if, if no one likes a budget, I promise you, just like no one likes meal prepping, other than really fit people, they learn to like it, right? Like your wife's pretty good at that. She eats very clean. She tracks exactly what she's going to be eating. She is physically fit, right? If you want to be financially fit, it's the same process. And that's what we're just trying to do. We're trying to make people eat their broccoli. We want you to join Spartan League so that we can track where your money's going and we can encourage you to make more. We want you to read pillars so that you can learn what I did and what other people did to start with a blue collar job and work your way up. I mean, Kyle, have I mentioned on here before like how much money I graduated when I when I graduated college, how much I had saved? Uh, I think you've said it once or twice on here before, yeah. Yeah, it was, I had my school paid for and my car paid for and a hundred grand in the bank. And I was just waiting tables at restaurants. I was not, you know, like some lawyer or some doctor. I was in school. I worked part time, but because I worked every day of the week and I didn't spend money on things, I had a hundred thousand dollars. I think a lot of people listening have never had a hundred thousand dollars in their life, but I gave up doing dumb things that other people did. I gave up a lot of convenience. You remember me back then. It was like, Probably frustrating how how frugal I was with everything, but that's Downer how I bought David. my first. What's that? Downer David. Downer David. Yeah, I was nope. Don't want to do it. But that's how I bought the first three properties was with that same hundred thousand dollars. When everybody else was scared to do it, I wasn't because I had that money saved up, and I just want more people to experience that same feeling. Yeah, and I I really like what you had to say about convenience, right? Because that is often. Uh, the enemy of our own success, our own financial success is we do things out of convenience. And it's funny because you also mentioned the tracking and I think convenience and tracking go hand in hand, right? The more we track, the more we're, we're willing to be uh, maybe inconvenient, the more we're willing to put a little bit of work into something. Uh, I have to replace my, my microwave because my microwave went out and I realized like, it's going to be like $600 to replace it. I'm like, that is ridiculous. I am not going to spend $600 to replace my microwave because it's broken. I'm going to go do some research and find something that's a lot cheaper that I can slide into that spot um, that's not going to cost me $600. To me, it makes more sense to do that. But like when you look at the companies like Amazon, it's interesting because you mentioned how we should be tracking ourselves for success. They do the same thing. Yeah. They track about how convenient they can make it for us so that we can get that same day shipping. So 
if they show us so many ads or whatever, they know if we see it so many times, we're finally going to click on it. We're going to buy that thing, right? They want to make things as convenient on us as possible because they want to provide good service, right? They want to be that best taco stand. But at the same time, like they know that if they can make themselves extremely convenient, we're more likely to spend our money with them than with some other competitor. And we're likely to spend more of that money. I like Mikhail's comment here. She said, I personally think credit card companies are scammers. Why would you give me a credit card when I'm a freshman in college? Make yeah. that make sense. It does make sense when you understand that credit card companies are not on your side. When we look at it like the world's my ally, then this doesn't make sense. When we look at it like, they are trying to take my money away from me. It makes perfect sense. Like when you're playing basketball, do you go after the best defender on the other team or do you go after their worst defender? The best. No, I'm saying if you're the if you're on offense, are you going to attack the worst oh, defender or the best? Yeah, you yeah, you you go after the worst. You go after yeah, the weakest sure. one, right? When you're playing football, you're literally trying to identify who is the weakest defender and how do we run a play to go at them? That Explode is the it, purpose yeah. because that is your adversary. OK, that's why they give credit cards to kids in college, because they're stupid. They don't know they're stupid. Like so Dave Ramsey says, that's why <laughs> he would say, don't have one when you're young. I didn't get a credit card till I was like in my mid 20s, probably like it was a long time because I just didn't need it. You use cash to pay for everything when you were on the envelope method so that you spent less money. That's what we're sitting here saying, guys, you're losing a fight because you don't know you're in it. You don't realize the opportunities you're missing out on. You don't realize the people that are taking the things that you want because you think that we're all socialistic, harmonious friends with each other and that we're all on the same side because the commercials make the companies look like they're your friends. It's always happy, smiling people drinking that beer or using that credit card. It's always like you get cash back rewards. You get 4%. We're helping you. They're not saying you're going to buy a bunch of stuff you don't need and spend money that you shouldn't have. And we're going to make money off of that if we can get you to spend more. Yeah, that's really well said. This is uh, this is good stuff. So I think for, for the people here, right, regardless of where you're at, maybe you've got a ton of financial debt, you've got credit card debt, you've got student loan debt, or you've got maybe just a little bit, or you you just are somebody who pays it off. Look at your entire financial uh, situation right now. Don't be afraid to open up and take a peek at what's going on, but then figure out how you're going to get yourself out of debt. And a lot of that is going to be you being the absolute best person that you can be, right? Committing yourself to being um, the best in the best financial position that you can. And that comes with like building the skill set that you need, but also getting around the people who are going to help you get there. Um, this has been a really good conversation and topic. Um, David, where does all of this fit into to pillars? When does it come out? Um, and is it going to be something that people can get like at BPCon? At BPCon, it will be the day it releases. I believe October 17th, it comes out. You can get it at biggerpockets.com slash pillars anytime, no matter when you're listening to this. If you guys are going to be at BPCon, I will sign it for you. And uh, if you're struggling, I just want you to understand you probably never got taught the rules of the sport you're playing and no one ever explained to you you're in a sport, but you freaking are. And the first step is just knowing someone else is trying to take what you have. And the minute you realize you're in a competition, everything changes. You play the game way differently. You spend your time in practice way differently. Your mindset is completely different. And the good news is very few people in this world are competing. This is why it's the 1% yeah. that does so well is they know they're in a competition. So even if you suck at basketball, if you just realize someone's keeping score, you immediately will become in the top 10% of basketball players just realizing you're in the competition. So don't be discouraged by this. Be encouraged to get involved. Check out SpartanLeague.com. Reach out to Kyle. If you're interested in getting our community, definitely do so. We're going to be improving it significantly in the future. And do check out Pillars because we're going to be starting like a literal book club type of movement behind the people that get into Pillars so that there can be a support group. I love book clubs. Um, David, one uh, just kind of final question for you. When it comes to hacking biology, um, specifically from a marketing perspective, right? Today's September 1st. Fall is in the air. Uh, it's a little cooler. It's a little windy. Starbucks, uh, I was just out there today, and they started selling their pumpkin spice latte today. What is it that they know about our biology and why people love 
pumpkin-y things and why they're going to spend a ton of money on it. I feel like you probably have something to say on this topic because a pumpkin spice has become an addiction, hasn't it? <laughs> Not for me, but for I know it girls. is for many... Yeah, exactly. For a lot of people out there. I'm not really a pumpkin-y type of person, but obviously there's something there that like gets people excited. The people just want to like, they want to hold it with two hands. Yes. Isn't that like the thing? They want to like on. cup their cup with two hands and just breathe yep. in. It's a, they're selling a feeling. That's a, that's what's happening. Okay. Like yeah. you're watching other, like that's what marketing companies do is they will, you ever notice every beer commercial always has good looking people smiling a lot in a friendship community. It's like a bunch of people on a beach and they're close. This is a family of people. They're all, they're not a real family, but they act like their family. They're, it's always in an environment that you'd want to be. And it's selling you on closeness because when you're drunk, you feel like people are close to you that are really not. This is why people make stupid decisions when they're drunk. They feel safer than they are. They don't realize they're in a competition when they're drinking. The pumpkin spice Starbucks thing is the same idea. You take someone who's stressed out not doing well in life, doesn't realize they're in a competition and they don't know why they feel bad. They just know they feel bad. They shouldn't be stressed out. Well, I, I'm not surprised when you're playing in a basketball game, you're feeling stress. It just isn't bad. It's fun, right? But it, I'm, the guy's trying to stop me. I'm trying to stop them. There's a lot at stake. Of course, I'm going to feel stressed. That stress helps me perform better. But if I don't know I'm in a game, I just think there's something wrong with me. Why do I have all this anxiety? Why can't I be calm? What do I need? Why is there no peace in my life? And then Starbucks comes along and they're like, if you only had this warm cup in your hands when the weather's cold, if you could breathe in that seductive pumpkin spice and just feel the dopamine rush through your brain, this is a safe place. This is a haven in a world that's really hard. And if you just come here and spend your money, you can buy the feeling, not the liquid that's in the cup. And then when you're there, they're like, hey, we also have this. We also have that. Do you want to add this onto your thing? Do you want to upgrade? Do you want to buy these snacks? They get more money from you. That's their job is to take your money from you and they're not your friends. They're not telling you the truth. They're telling you what needs to be said to get what they want. And it's okay to just accept that's how the world works. It's no one else's job to be our friends. It's our job to protect ourselves. It is our job to defend ourselves. It is our job to think critically and give a plan to every dollar so that we achieve what we want. It is okay to beat the companies that are taking money from us. It is okay to beat our coworkers. It is okay to work harder than everyone else and earn the promotion or earn the better job. It is okay to be the best taco person in the world. That's actually a better path to go on. And if everyone does it, we all get better tacos. And who's mad about that? No one. We all want better tacos. And I think I think that's that's the key, man. Like just being aware of what's out there. Um, Starbucks is not out to like, you know, make everybody's lives miserable. They want to bring a little bit of uh happiness into people's lives and they want you to find that happiness. But true happiness, true peace, true whatever is not gonna be found in the product that they're selling you, right? That's not where you're gonna find it. But they want you to think that, especially these big companies that have these amazing marketing schemes. And so there's nothing wrong inherently with a pumpkin spice latte, right? We're not like shaming people who want to spend some money on a pumpkin spice latte. Um, you know, I, I'm not a fan of them myself, but doesn't mean you're a bad person if you want one. It's just being aware of what's the reason for you purchasing that thing. If you're purchasing it to make yourself feel better, um, it's not going to be the antidote. It's not going to be the answer to the, the problems in your life. A lot of times the answers are, um, you know, whatever you, the answer really is you becoming the best version of yourself yeah. um, and figuring out how you can get there. And again, surrounding yourself with people that are going to help you find that too. Yeah. That's what Ryan and I talked about in his podcast. One of the themes that kept coming up was the beautiful thing about business is there are no defenders trying to stop you from being your best. Like there are in sports. There's mm -hmm. no one that's like getting in your way so you can't make it into the door on time at nine o'clock. It's not like American Gladiators where you got this big roided out person with a big uh, pad in front of you trying to stop you from getting past them. The only thing that stops us is us. Our BS, the things we hold on to, the lack of forgiveness we don't want to offer, the stress that we carry, the resentment that we hold, the belief that it's supposed to be easy, the fear of failure, all of that's real. But that's the only defender in this game. It's you. You're literally the problem. Okay. So you can attack that part of you that is stopping you from being more successful 
by getting in a community of Spartans that are all standing there with you by following the stuff in pillars when it comes out, but just by understanding that you're in a competition, you, when you're in a competition, you get close to your teammates because you need them. Okay. Like nothing's stopping you guys from being millionaires, but your own bad habits or your own false beliefs or your own issues, because you wish the world would change when you just accept the world is what it is. And people want the best tacos. And you put all that energy towards making the best taco. The next thing, you know, you got to line out the door and everything we're talking about, like hiring leverage systems, delegation, it all makes sense because you got to get the best tacos out as fast as you can. When you don't put your energy into being the best taco, when you're constantly trying to trick other people or get them to buy your tacos without putting effort into it, every day just feels like it sucks and you don't know why. That's it. So today's uh, today's recap or summary is going to be uh, don't buy pumpkin spice lattes, go out and buy tacos, the best tacos instead. Absolutely. Kyle, thanks for being here, man. You're uh, I know you're not feeling good today, but you're looking great. Uh, you're thank doing you. your job of being the eye candy that I hired you for. So thank you for that. Uh, I used to get jealous when I was around better looking people than me until I heard a person talking about backup dancers. Have you heard this theory, Kyle? No, but I like backup so dancers. The idea behind really talented backup dancers is it tricks the eye who's watching it. So if the person dancing, the main person kind of sucks, you they look like they're better if their backup dancers are really good. Oh yeah. Like you just, your brain starts like, maybe they're not, I don't know what makes you good at dancing. Maybe like the backup dancers are doing this like really dramatic move. And then mm -hmm. the main person's like a little tiny stubby thing or something. But if you see the stubby thing with everyone else being dramatic, your brain sort of associates it all together and it makes them look better. So instead of being jealous about how good looking you are, I realize you're actually just upping the level of attractiveness that I have being around you. Yeah, well, uh, yeah, we'll just we'll just leave it at that because uh, I'm not even necessarily uh, eye candy these days. The older and older I get, it feels like it's. Uh, Dude, it's, you're aging you know, better. You're aging older. like wine. You're like getting. Well, that's like, good. You look the same way that you did at 18. Look at me. I've lived four lifetimes since I was 18. <laughs> Yes, that's true. That's true. But yeah, really good stuff. Uh, and it, this has been a fun conversation. And the, it's funny that you mentioned the backup dancer thing, because I watched a YouTube video today of uh, Michael Jackson when he was at like the 1995 Super Bowl or something like that. And he had all his backup dancers. And I was thinking exactly like um, they probably make him look bigger, better and more powerful than if he was just up there by himself. So it definitely helps to have a posse around you that's going to build you up and make you better. Thanks to everybody else for being here. You can follow Kyle at, at Kyle Ranky on Instagram or Facebook or other social media. You can follow me at David Green 24. If you're not already doing that, go give me a follow. You can also go to davidgreen24.com to see what we offer. We're going to be having some more, we're going to call them accelerators, programs for investors. You want to learn more about Burr, long distance real estate investing, your real estate agent that wants to step up their game, house hacking, whatever it is, we're going to have six week courses that you can take with an intense focus on helping step up your game. Kyle will be teaching some of those as well as other team members that I have. So follow me at my website, davygreen24.com to see when those are being offered. Would love to see you guys there and I will see you next Friday. Thanks guys. See ya. <laughs>